Hey everybody, what's going on? Hexlex here, again, another Master Duel video for you. So we're coming back to Sprite once again, uh, because of course we are, because it's me and this is my favorite uh, competitive archetype right now. And actually, it's one of my favorite archetypes in general. And uh, I've hit Master 1 with it. As of the 13th, which is a couple of days ago at the time I'm recording this, uh, we have reached Master 1 with pure Sprite. And this is the same, well, this is a slight variation of the same list that I've been laddering with uh, this whole time, right? Uh, the list I was talking about going 25 and 5 with. So, uh, when I made the changes that I did, I was at Master 2 with 4 wins left. I made those changes, and then I won those 4 games and went straight to Master 1. Uh, I've also, of course, been doing some testing beyond just that as well. Uh, not just within Master 1, but also um, with some friends and a little bit on stream as well. And honestly, I think that this list is, I don't, I don't think, I'm not like 100% convinced this is like the list. Uh, there are a couple of minor changes that I could see myself making that I'll talk about here in a moment. But um, I, one, think that Pure Sprite is absolutely the best Sprite variant in this meta. Uh, a lot of people, for some reason, I don't know, for some reason, you know, when Swap Frog and Jack got limited, that, I think, scared a lot of people from even trying the deck, especially Swap Frog going to one. A lot of people saw Swap Frog go to one and were like, well, now what do we do for a ninja? What are you going to throw in a dupe frog? This thing kind of sucks. What are you doing here? Here's the thing, though, right? We're always summoning Swap Frog off of the Gigantic, right? Unless we just happen to draw it, but even when it was at 2, and even at 3, you never really relied on just hard drawing the Swap Frog. We're always summoning it off of Gigantic, so the Frog Engine is not any worse at all. It's literally the same, you just sometimes open Swap Frog like le even less often now, which again, opening Swap Frog even when it was at 3 was an absolute luxury. It was not at all required. Uh, the other aspect of Jet going to 1 is honestly totally fine as well. Uh, I haven't done this in pure Sprite, but in the past in other Sprite variants where I'm using Sprite as more of an engine, I've only played the one Jet, even when this card was at like 2 I think at the time. Uh, and honestly, you know, having the one copy is not that bad. One of the main things that I, I've found people saying is like, but with one Jet, you, you can't search Gamma Burst as often, which I don't understand this at all for multiple reasons. One. Uh, you can absolutely still search Game of Burst pretty much whenever you need it. Jet is very searchable off of Blue, which is very searchable off of Gigantic or Starter. It's very, it's very slightly less consistent because you maybe don't open with Jet, like, quite as often, but it's still totally fine. Uh, it's still completely fine. Uh, on top of that, even, again, before the current hits, I found myself winning the minority of my games with Game of Burst, even the minority of my going second games, right? Because... Uh, a lot of the time, this deck is actually capable of just generating uh, enough board presence, enough advantage, and in turn, enough damage to have lethal in play, even without the Gamma Burst, right? Uh, it's got the ability to remove the opponent's monsters pretty easily, and on top of that, it has the ability to just, again, spit out a ton of very relevant bodies. Also, we have other tools that can help us OTK, namely uh, the recent release of number two Ninja Shadow Mosquito. I have caved and crafted this card, even though you can pull it out of the Legacy Packs. I, you know, I really wanted, I needed it for the Sprite deck because I do think it is optimal to play this card. So I went ahead and crafted it, and I've absolutely not regretted it at all. Number two Ninja Shadow Mosquito is incredibly good. Uh, basically, what this does is uh, whenever any monster battles, you can either put a hallucination counter on one of your opponent's monsters or deal damage to your opponent equal to the attack of a monster with a hallucination counter on it. Uh, the Shadow Mosquito itself also cannot be destroyed by battle, and you take no damage from battles involving it, so um, it very well felicits, o facilitates rather, uh, OTKs by, you know, of course, you can just ram it into something, uh, put a counter on your opponent's strongest monster, and then you don't even need to have the Gamma Burst, right? Because even if you start crashing your little sprite monsters into your opponent's big monster, your opponent is still going to be taking more damage, because they'll be taking damage equal to their big monster's attack, and you're only taking damage equal to the difference. So, assuming you will start at full life points, you will absolutely win that exchange. Um, in that regard, we also have another Xyz monster here in the extra deck thing that can potentially help us OTK. That's the Cat Shark. Cat Shark is going to be making a return to my Sprite extra deck. Um, back in the day, you know, when Sprite first came out in Master Duel, I think, I think we actually had Gamma Burst, right? Like, Gamma Burst was part of the initial release of cards, and, uh, we didn't really OTK with it that often. We would more often use the Cat Shark here. 
uh, as an ability to OTK without having to rely on any main deck searches. So, you know, even if you are worried about the jet being at one because of game members, which you shouldn't be, it, I, I can tell you from much experience, it does not affect it at all. Uh, we still have multiple options to OTK now. The Cat Shark. The Cat Shark actually does represent something besides an OTK. So the Cat Shark can make a 6,400 gigantic sprite, right? It can make a it can double the sprite up to uh, 6,400 attack points, and that is actually big enough to threaten a giant X Pearly Noir. Now, to be fair, the X Pearly Noir can just, you know, detach you and tuck the gigantic back into the extra deck, but what this does is a lot of the time, this will make the Noir be able to be affected by card effects. So, uh, if you have like an imperm face down, like let's say your opponent has a six material Noir, uh, you can make a gigantic, boost it up to 6,400 attack. If your opponent detaches two down to four materials to try to get rid of the gigantic so it's affected again, you could say flip down a face up imperm or activate the effect of a red that's on your board to sack off the cat shark to negate and destroy the noir. Of course, then the noir would be able to use its effect again, but um, the main point is that there are very, very niche scenarios. I haven't actually been in one myself yet, but in theory, there are very, very niche scenarios where the gigantic can actually help us play through uh, Pearly a little bit there. I did mention before that there are two main deck slots that I am, or a couple. Uh, I don't know if I was specific about it, but there are two main deck slots I'm kind of reconsidering here. Uh, I just mainly don't know what I would slot in uh, for certain. I have some ideas, but nothing concrete yet. The Pot of Prosperity is a bit of a placeholder for me. Oh, I didn't even say this directly yet, but we took out the Melfi cards. Um, the main reason I took out the Melfi engine is because, honestly, I was sick of main decking two Garnets and using three extra deck slots, three when you counted the Merry Melfis, just to make a Herald of the Arc Light. It just seemed super mid. Uh, it doesn't really seem to be, like much of a reason to like the reason to play the melfies into herald in the past right was to play around tier limits but even in tier zero format when i was playing pure sprite like i don't know the the end board of avermax plus herald of the arc light like wasn't often enough to end it i usually needed more than that so i, I in, in the hindsight i think the herald the melfi line has always been a little bit mid we just kind of played it to play around tier limits, and I think most people are now just playing it out of habit. I, I don't think it's optimal anymore. Uh, I think it should be taken out. Um, I'm kind of thinking about taking out this Prosperity for like a Veiler or something. Uh, Prosperity is kind of in here as a filler slot a little bit, but of course it's also still a very good card, especially going first here. Um, I have had games where Prosperity has dug me into the out, so I do like it. Uh, if you're wondering what three we banish here on turn one, uh, I will banish the Nightmare Unicorn, which is another card that I've put in the extra deck uh, to replace some of the Melfi cards. I banish the Cat Shark, because we really don't often need this uh, to OTK or battle over stuff. Uh, and I banish the Sky Cavalry Centuria. Yeah, I just extremely rarely find myself actually going into this card, so... Um, yeah, I think that's pretty good. Also, uh, I talked about the OTK applications of number two Ninja Shadow Mosquito. However, this card can absolutely be made going first as well. In fact, if you make this card and then also make the Elf plus IP and then go into Avermax, you've got a very interesting situation because uh, the Shadow Mosquito forces your opponent's monsters to attack. It says all your monsters your opponent controls must attack if able. And, of course, Avermax says that your opponent cannot target monsters with attacks besides this one. So, uh, not only do you get to trigger the Shadow Mosquito's effect when you're forcing your opponent to start battling into your Avermax, of course, if they begin crashing into your Avermax, you're just pretty much always going to win that fight, because this monster is very difficult to actually out by battle. So, yeah, cool stuff. We are... Definitely rocking this sprite list pretty hard. The other card I was kind of thinking about taking out was the third triple tack, right? Um, there have just been a couple of games where opening two copies of this or like top decking another copy of it has just kind of screwed me over. So, um, I don't know. This is always, whenever I include this in a deck, it's always a fight whether I want two or three. I really like having it in my hand, so I really like having three in that regard. But again, having multiple copies of it is not that great, so... That's pretty much where I am at with the list. Let's go ahead and break it down card by card and we'll see these games. We're gonna watch the four games I played with this variant up to Master 4. So I'm on one Dupe Frog, one Swap Frog, one Ronin Toad, and three Maxi, two Sprite, or sorry, two Nimble Angler, uh, three Nimble Beaver, two Sprite Blue, one Sprite Jet, one Sprite Pixie is actually another new addition that I really like, uh, not just for OTKing, but also just for protecting your monsters. Uh, good stuff overall. 
two Sprite Red, two Sprite Carrot, three Ash Blossom, and Joyous Spring, uh, two Cashier Fenrir, one Nibiru the Primal Being, one Foolish Burial, three Triple Tactics Talent, one Pot of Prosperity, two Call by the Grave, one Cross Out Designator, two Sprite Starter, one Sprite Gamer Burst, one Sprite Smashers, and three Infinite Permanents. There's our main deck. For the extra deck run, one Sky Cavalry Centuria, one Cat Shark, one Oni Bimaru Soul Sweeper, two Gigantic Sprite, one Number Two Ninja Shadow Mosquito, one Downward Magician, one Divine Arsenal, Ah Zeus Sky Thunder, one IP Masquerina, two Sprite Elf, one Sprite Sprint, one Nightmare Unicorn, one Mech Knight Crusade Avermax, and then one Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. There's our list. Let's see some games. All right, we're going to see these games uh, in the order that I played them. So, again, like I mentioned during the deck profile, uh, I made these updates when I was on Master 2 with four wins left, and I won the four games in a row. So this is the first of those four games. We're playing against Pearly here, going to be taking the first turn. Opening hand's looking phenomenal. We have a Nimble Beaver and a couple of Sprite Monsters to accompany it. So I'm going to special summon the Carrot, but not the Jet. That looks a little bit weird here, but it's to play around Nibiru. It's the same reason we're going into the Gigantic right now. And I think that it is imperative to be playing around Nibiru in this format. Uh, Nibiru is at a relatively all-time high in terms of its popularity. I'm sure it's been more popular in the past, but it's definitely at its most popular that it's been arguably like in the year 2023 is uh, the amount of Nibirus that are being played right now. Especially, uh, sp um, what is it, um, Pearly, the deck we're playing against right here. Uh, very often plays multiple copies of Nibiru. So we want to make sure that we're going into our Gigantic Sprite as early as possible into our plays. Uh, that way we are able to uh, go ahead and make sure that we're too locked and our opponent is as well, which means they can't summon the Nibiru. So as you can see here, my opponent has had every form of disruption under the sun for me, uh, which is not surprising given that they're on Pearly, which can often play a lot of disruption. I got Veilard, I got Ash Blossom, I got Ghost Ogre, and we're still able to go. It's one of the strengths of this deck, honestly. Uh, the Ghost Ogre, thankfully, destroyed but not negated the Elf. That means we can still bring back the Angler and then link the two off for a Sprint. Sprint's gonna go ahead and send our other Nimble Angler, which will pull out our remaining, or one Beaver, because we opened the other copy. Only one Nimble Beaver left in our deck, but we can still make a 3200 Gigantic here and then pass back over to our opponent. So the reason I went for this 3200 Gigantic, right? Uh, is because, I, I don't know, I, I could go for Elf to bring back Carrot because I, of course, already used Elf in order to just to be able to make uh, the board presence that I have. Also, the 3200 Gigantic is really difficult for Pearly to OTK over, and I'm already suspecting that my opponent's on Pearly just due to the sheer amount of hand traps that they played on the first turn, right? Um, also, of course, in this meta, especially at this current point in time, it's not a far-fetched assumption to be assuming your opponent's on Pearly. Even if they're not on Pearly, right? They're only going to have three cards left and already have to play through my Ash Blossom. And there's a lot of decks that are going to have a really hard time doing that and then also getting over a 3200 beat stick. So those are the reasons why I went for the Gigantic. Also, I've got the Beaver into plays next turn because it can summon stuff from the graveyard. But it's going to activate my friend Pearly. I'm going to chain the Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. I find that for Ash Blossom, my friend Pearly does end up being the best choke point for the deck. Opponent's going to follow up with a Pearly Sleepy Memory to grab a regular Pearly. They end up discarding the Happy Memory. So, uh, as you can see, my opponent actually had a really good hand for an OTK setup if I'd actually had a monster they could OTK into. Their hand was My Friend Pearly Sleepy and Happy Memory. Of course, I also had the Ash Blossom to mess them up, but, um, you know, my opponent could have very easily just, uh, if I had, didn't have the Ash Blossom, uh, made the Happiness. But again, uh, they wouldn't be able to OTK over the Gigantic. It is too big. Pearly is going to be activating here. Uh, they find a sleepy memory as well as the street grabbing the sleepy memory and they're just passing over to me. So this is exactly the position I wanted to find myself in. I get to normal summon our remaining nimble beaver. Gonna use that to bring back the angler from the graveyard. And then as I go to activate the gigantic sprite effect, my opponent's gonna concede they recognize that I have far more than enough materials on board in order to make lethal. So there you have it. That's our first of these four games on our way up to Master 1. Uh, as you can see, this game was a great example of how this deck is very capable of pushing through um, lots of forms of disruption. So cool stuff. Let's go ahead and go into the next one. My next opponent is on Salamon Great, which is not a deck I've faced against, period, in a long time. And especially to see it up here at Master 2, uh, huge props to my opponent playing this deck here. Of course, it is still a good deck. Um, it's, again, just not one I expected to see uh, so high so early in the season. So, 
This time we're going second, but let's go to do the Cyanet Mining. Thankfully I opened the Ash Blossom as well as the Imperm, so I was thinking my opponent was on Math Mag here when I saw the Cyanet Mining. Uh, also, what did we pitch with Cyanet? I believe it was an Imperm, if I recall correctly. Uh, yes, it was Imperm. So, uh, I didn't really get any information from this, right? It's just Cyanet pitch Imperm. Uh, the Ash Blossom is going to resolve against it, so opponents will be left with three cards. It's really good to Ash Blossom a card like Cyanet Mining when you can. Cards that require an initial card investment. That way we have advantage, card advantage over our opponent. That just means we have access to more cards. I've got four, they've got three. So, Hand is also looking phenomenal. We have plays and we have a call by to back them up. Well, it's going to draw phase max C, but I have a call by for it. So, uh, we're not going to have to worry about that. I am still going to be thinking about stuff like Imperm and Ash Blossom and Nibiru in my opponent's hand just in case. Um, because, again, I assumed they were on Math Mech at this point. And Math Mech actually kind of like Pearly, although I don't think quite to the same extent. Um, but like Pearly is a deck that's capable of running a lot of forms of disruption. So, going to start with the Carrot, then Special the Blue. Blue's going to add Jet. Uh, opponent doesn't have any disruption so far. This is looking like a pretty straightforward path to victory. You'll note that I did not actually add the Gamma Burst. I added the starter there. And you're probably thinking, Hex, what are you doing? The Jet's supposed to add the, the Gamma Burst. What are you doing? Well, here's the thing, right? Uh, because we have the Cat Shark in our extra deck, uh, among just, you know, good card presence in general, I don't need the Gamma Burst to OTK here. This is a point that I really wanted to emphasize because, again, I think the most common point I've seen, not only in my comment section, but just in Master Duel talk in general, right, uh, against playing sprites in this meta is, Jet's only at one! How are you gonna Gamma Burst OTK? It's like, again, one, we're gonna do it the same way we've always done it, and two, we don't need to do it because we can just win games like this. Um, the reason, by the way, to uh, not get the Gamma Burst here, but to get the uh, starter, rather, is so that way I can starter for red, and then I have both red and carrot up as my Gigantic is beginning the plays. The Gigantic will end up blocking my opponent out of Nib. The Gigantic is the fifth summon here, but again, I have the red, so even if they have Nib, that's fine, and it doesn't matter if they have Ash Boss, if they have Imper, it literally doesn't matter what they have in hand, because I have both red and carrot, I can stop it, and my Gigantic is going to resolve, and I'll be able to find lethal, so... That's pretty good stuff. Again, uh, so much fear over the jet being at one. It's completely unwarranted. It's it's 100% fine. This deck really does not play any differently at all than it did before. We still have a couple more games to check out. Let's go straight into those. All right, for our third game, we're going to find ourselves against another pure sprite deck. Uh, opponent is on Melfi's, um, which to be fair, I don't think Melfi's are like horrible. Um, I don't think they're necessarily optimal, but I don't think they're horrible by any means. Uh, also playing a Gamma package, Cyframe Gamma, so. Uh, as you can see, this hand was uh, pretty miserable. <laughs> uh, this is a hand that you can kind of get sometimes, or you just get one. Basically just getting a level 2 monster without a sprite and not being able to have plays. Um, it sucks, but it does happen. Uh, it's really a shame, too, because I had both Ash Blossom and Triple Tack to help insulate my combo here, if I had one. <laughs> like, like the Fairly Odd Parents theme, if I had one, <laughs> but it's fine. That's Smiles, we've got the Smiles, or whatever he says. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, this is still completely fine here, right? We'll set the Imperm. We do still have the Ash Blossom going into our opponent's turn. That and the Imperm provides a decent amount of disruption. And this is also why I wouldn't include Pixies. I like playing more Sprite Monsters. Um, just to give ourselves more consistency and hopefully avoid situations like this. Opponent's going to normal Pixie special Jet. Jet's going to grab Gamma Burst. Already the opponent is beginning to threaten lethal. Starter's coming down. I'm going to chain the Ash Blossom to that. Oh, I wanted to talk about this earlier as well. Um, because I saw an opponent uh, during that last duel use the Ash Blossom against my Jet, which I don't think was right. I don't think it's ever right to Ash or Imperm Blue or Jet. Pretty much any of the main deck's right monsters, right? Um, I mean, of course, as always, in certain situations, it can be good, but uh, I definitely prefer to save Ash Blossom for the starter, or for the Gigantic, or for the Sprint. Those are all more high-value targets, uh, especially the Gigantic and the Sprint. Well, really all three of them, right? Um, especially if Starter is starting the plays, it definitely Ash that. Um, but again, as far as with Ash and Imperm, uh, Sprint or Gigantic, that's what I tend to prefer to negate, just depending on the situation. Um, I, if you can wait for that gigantic, do that, but sometimes negating the sprint will just stop their plays altogether, so it just depends, but, like I said, Ash Blossoming the starter here, opponent's going to link off the Jet and the Pixies for the Elf here, actually, Elf is going to activate, targeting the Pixies, I'm just going to use the Imperm here, right, so the reason I'm using the Imperm here is because, uh, and I know I said, you know, you should probably wait for the gigantic, but, 
Here, I kind of, I don't want my opponent to be in a situation where they have the Gigantic anyway, because it's turn two and they can battle, right? That means even if they summon Gigantic and I negate it with Imperm, they can still battle with it and then just go into a Zeus. And I definitely don't want that to happen. Um, also, if I, even if my opponent has a blue or a jet in hand, they can't summon it with Elf because those require a level or a rank two. So that's why I'm Imperming the Elf here. Again, like I said, when exactly you Imperm, as always, is ever just depends on the situation, but um, generally speaking, to stop a turn one play, uh, you want to Ash or Imperm the Sprint or Gigantic Gigantic if possible. Hey, speaking of Pixies, we actually managed to top deck it here. Opponent's going to chain, though, to my normal summon, uh, both the Elf effect and the activation of Sprite Starter. Um, this would normally be a lot more problematic for me, except for the fact that I have the triple tax, so... I'm actually not particularly concerned about what my opponent's doing. I'm just going to fire off the triple attack to take control, and I'm going to end up taking the Sprite Elf here. I'm going to special the Pixies, and then link it off with my Nimble Angler, going for the Sprint. Of course I know that my opponent has the Red and Jet on the field, but even if this Sprint gets negated, one, they can't negate and destroy it, because I took away the Elf, and so you need to sack a Link or a Rank 2 in order to destroy the monster. Uh, two, I can just go ahead and make plays anyway. Uh, I even anticipated that my opponent probably had a negate here for the elf, which is completely fine because now I get to just overlay the sprint and the elf for the gigantic. Gigantic's gonna always be at 3200. This also, of course, means that even if I don't end the duel on this turn, I don't have to give my elf, uh, the elf, back to my opponent. Rather, my elf. It's my elf. <laughs> so. Alright, moving to the battle phase here as I get negated, I'm going to go ahead and try to attack the red here. Uh, I ended up chaining my Gamma Burst, but I actually don't think I needed to because I forget this affects everything. And not just mine, like both mine and my opponent did, so we both just kind of like traded our Gamma Burst here for no real reason. We we both had this moment. I think what happened is both of us were in such of the heat of the moment because this is an intense situation to be in, uh, especially as you're approaching Master 1, right? Um, we both just kind of had this idea in our head that Gamma Burst only affected our stuff, so... We both end up needlessly using it, but I guess at least we both misplayed it, if we were both going to misplay it. And hey, speaking of that line I was talking about before, I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Uh, again, I wanted to stop my opponent from summoning Gigantic last turn to stop this exact thing from happening. I'm going to go ahead and make a 4 material Zeus and end on that here. So, with only two cards in my hand, my opponent's hand, and uh, me having access to two board wipes, uh, it's definitely not looking super great for my opponent. They are going to be able to use Smashers here uh, in order to get rid of my Zeus, but um, it's honestly fine because, yeah, the board gets wiped and the Smashers is not going to resolve. Uh, that might seem a little bit odd. You might be thinking like, wait, wasn't Smashers supposed to banish the Zeus here? But the reason I say that was completely fine is because Smashers does actually need to banish the level ranker Link to in order to banish the other monster as well. So... Because I had actually chained to the Smashers and removed the level 2 monster that was on the field, they no longer had a card to banish, and therefore their card did not end up resolving. So, there we have that game. We have one more duel. Our last one I'm actually pretty excited to share, so let's go straight into it here. Alright, our final game is going to be against Cash Tira Punk, um, which I also showed this game on stream. Um, a little late to be plugging this, but why not? Uh, for those of you who are not yet aware, I have begun regularly streaming over on Twitch. So, uh, twitch.tv slash hexlexlive, link is going to be in the description below. I greatly appreciate any support over there, uh, whether you hang out and, you know, join the stream with us, or if you just give a follow, uh, it definitely means a lot. Uh, you can also follow, of course, on Twitch to get an idea of when I stream. It'll give you notifications. But if you're interested in a schedule, I also post that over on my Twitter. Link, once again, in the description below. So, I'm um, going to be starting this turn with a Fenrir plus level 2 into Sprint line. Um, opponent is going to end up Ash Blossoming the Gigantic Sprite here. This hand's pretty awkward, and I actually ended up making a pretty big fumble here. This was my rank-up game into Master 1, too. So... I'm going to use the Ronin to bring itself back and then link the two off for the uh, Sprite Elf here, right? Next, I'm going to activate my Sprite Elf's effect to bring back the Ronin. And then I set the two Imperms and pass. Now, you might be wondering, Lex, why didn't you link off into like an IP or something before you ended? And that would have actually been the optimal move. But I don't know if anybody else experiences this. And I definitely had this happen recently with the branded Despia video I made. 
Sometimes my brain just feeds me information that's like not correct and I just accept it, right? Like with the Branded Despia video, my brain was like, you don't need Branded in red or Branded in white, it's fine. Also put Guardian Chimera in your extra deck. And I was just like, okay brain, you're the boss. So here, for some reason, I had it in my head that the Sprint, you know, the one that's making my Gigantic have 3200 attack, I thought it was in the graveyard for some reason. My plan was to not go into IP here so I could keep the Gigantic, bring back the Sprint when my opponent summons something, and then potentially have a bounce. Um, which, if I had Sprint in my graveyard, that actually would be fine, because I also have two Imperms here to stop my opponent from having like any kind of high impact plays on the board itself. But, again, here's the problem. The Sprint is under my Gigantic. <laughs> it's not in the graveyard. So, yeah. My brain was like... All right, here's the information, here's the situation. I just, I blind trusted it. I went, okay. So, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, opponent's going to drop the cashier unicorn here. I've got the imperm for that. That'll allow me to, of course, not only negate the effect to search birth, but also uh, stop them from banishing from my extra deck. I'm gonna normal summon Zami, revealing themselves to be punk cash. I'm gonna imperm that as well, and just kind of hope that they go to Barone and they just kind of stop after that. Um, and it seems like that is going to end up being what they do here. They're summoning the Baron de Fleur, dropping the Omni Negate on the board, and activating the effect to pop my elf, but they actually have a follow-up e -telly. so here obviously things are not looking good. Uh, you know, the Rising Carp is going to get summoned here. I do have the Nib, but of course they have the Baron up now. I'm still going to throw out the Nib just to use up my opponent's Omni Negate. This is probably the best use I'm going to get out of Nibiru this whole game, so I'll just do it now. And yeah, opponent's activating the Rising Carp effect. They're grabbing the Deer Note and the Wagon. Wagon is, of course, going to grab the Field Spell. They're going to sync off for the Jam Dragon Drive. No Chaos Ruler here because they're on Cash Punk. Uh, not the Chaos Punk or Bestial Punk, whatever you want to call it. Jam Dragon Drive gets to pay six and add the Ash Blossom. Or not the Ash Blossom, the Ghost Ogre. Deer Note gets to bring back Sharkusai. Oh my god, I need water. There we go. And, uh, yeah, they get to draw a card as well. But you might have noticed that they went straight to battle phase. They didn't go into pep. They went straight to battle phase and left me with my strongest monster, also my most relevant one. Here's something I don't think I've mentioned about my opponent yet. They're in Master 1. I got paired against somebody who was in Master 1 for my rank up game, which has happened to me multiple, many, many times before. And, uh, I've never had an opponent do quite what my opponent's about to do here, so... Uh, they're going to pass, of course, even though they didn't finish me this turn. The Sharakusai absolutely still represents uh, the threat of the Amazing Dragon. Opponent also gets to sack the Barone, or put it back in the extra deck, rather, to go for the Unicorn. Makes sense because I've already forced them to use the Barone Zombie Negate, so... I'm going to activate Gigantic. Opponent is chaining the Amazing Dragon effect in response. Uh, speaking of amazing, by the way, uh, how amazing was this blue top deck here? I'm going to use a Gigantic to get the Jet. Uh, I still get the Jet's effect, even if it's going to get bounced. Uh, I will get a Banish from my extra deck here due to the Unicorn, but I'm not super concerned about that as I have multiple paths to victory here. But I was actually going to take an Elf, which I actually think was a pretty good call here because it was the last one left in my extra. So, grabbing a starter off of the uh, Jet, I'm going to then normal that Jet. Special the Blue. Blue is going to allow me to add the Red. I'm going to use Starter here for the Carrot to try to play around the back row. Uh, special the red, and I'm going to overlay for the Shadow Mosquito. So here's my plan here, right? Uh, my plan is to run the Shadow Mosquito into the Amazing Dragon, activate the effect, detach the material, and put a hallucination counter on it. Now, Shadow Mosquito, again, triggers whenever any monster on the field declares an attack. It could be yours, it could be your opponent's, it does not have to be just Shadow Mosquito. Uh, it, nor does it have to be a battle that even involves Shadow Mosquito. From there, I can ram my red and my carrot into the cashier unicorn. I'll take a little bit of damage, but for each attack, my uh, mosquito is going to inflict 3,000 to my opponent, which should be enough to finish them off with two attacks. That's the plan here, but unfortunately, my opponent's ghost ogre is going to throw a wrench in that situation. I do get to use red to sack the carrot and the gate. Won't have lethal, but it'll protect my mosquito, except for the fact that my opponent has the Nashiwashi surprise here. Nashiwari surprise, rather, so... That's going to end up popping my Mosquito and completely just tank my entire game plan. So at this point, I've effectively lost this duel, right? My last card that my opponent knows is in my hand as well is just another Cashier Fenrir. Uh, you know, I've got the red. 
Uh, but here my opponent is curiously switching the Unicorn to defense mode before activating the effect. I've been getting little hints from my opponent here that like they might end up being a little bit generous, and I've never actually had somebody do this in Master Duel, but in other digital card games I've played, like uh, Hearthstone, and I th think I might have had it happen in Legends of Runeterra once, where I'm going for a rank up into like the top rank, uh, like Legend in Hearthstone, and my opponent who's already there, I get matched up with an opponent who's already at that rank, um, and well, I don't want to spoil what's going to happen too quickly here, because it's going to happen here in just a moment. But yeah, my opponent's like completely just setting up here. They smack with the Amazing Dragon, smack with the Brome, put me down to 400 life points, and then they concede themselves. They did a total bro move and just let me in the Master 1, which is awesome. I definitely appreciate that, Ryu. Huge shout out to you if you're out there. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this is the first time it's ever happened in Master Duel, even though I've had multiple games where I've had my rank up game into top rank against somebody who's already there, which I don't blame people for doing this, right? Like, they still try anyway, and they just they end up beating me and I rank down. Or not rank down, but, you know, I don't rank up, rather. Um, but I don't blame people for doing that. Like, I am the kind of person who always likes to try my hardest every game, so I definitely see it. But we always appreciate a bro move like this as well. It's never expected, but it's always welcome, so... Uh, that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. Um, yeah, hope you all enjoyed it, and I am just going to move to my outro now. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this video. Thank you for watching it all the way to the very end. That means a whole lot to me, and it's also a fantastic way to support the channel. And if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways besides YouTube, there are plenty of ways to do that. If you check out the description below, you'll find a bunch of links down there. One of them goes to my Patreon. You're actually seeing the names of everyone subscribed to the Patreon on the screen right now. So if you're interested in getting your name in the credits here at the end, if you want to see more daily Master Duel content, or if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one private coaching sessions, I offer for all of that on Patreon. I also stream live on Twitch. Feel free to go ahead and click that link and follow and or subscribe there. I also have the Discord community if you want to follow that link where hundreds of duelists have already signed up. Free to join and you can just come hang out, talk about the game, and chill in general. The final link that's going to be in the description is my Twitter. You can follow that if you want some more notifications of what's happening with the channel. So all in all, thank you all so much for watching and I hope you have a fantastic day.